call me Jonah. My parents did, or nearly did. They called me John. Jonah, John, if I'd been a Sam, I would have been a Jonah still. Not because I've been unlucky for others, but because somebody or something has compelled me to be certain places at certain times, without fail. Conveyances and motives, both conventional and bizarre, have been provided. And according to plan, at each appointed second, at each appointed place, this Jonah was there. Listen, when I was a younger man, two wives ago, 250,000 cigarettes ago, 3,000 quarts of booze ago, when I was a much younger man, I began to collect material for a book to be called The Day the World Ended. The book was to be factual. The book was to be an account of what important Americans had done on the day when the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. It was to be a Christian book. I was a Christian then. I am a Baconanist now. I would have been a Baconanist then if there had been anyone to teach me the bittersweet lies of Baconan. But Baconanism was unknown beyond the gravel beaches and coral knives that ring this little island in the Caribbean Sea, the Republic of San Lorenzo. We Baconanists believe that humanity is organized into teams, teams that do God's will without ever discovering what they are doing. Such a team is called a carass by Baconan, and the instrument, the can-can, that brought me into my own particular carass was the book I never finished the book to be called The Day the World Ended. If you find your life tangled up with somebody else's life for no very logical reasons, writes Baconan, that person may be a member of your caress. At another point in the books of Baconan, he tells us, man created the checkerboard, God created the caress. By that he means that a caress ignores national, institutional, occupational, familial, and class boundaries. It is as free form as an amoeba. In his 53rd Calypso, Baconan invites us to sing along with him. Oh, a sleeping drunkard up in Central Park, and a lion hunter in the jungle dark. And a Chinese dentist and a British queen All fit together in the same machine Nice, nice, very nice Nice, nice, very nice Nice, nice, very nice So many different people in the same device About my caress then it surely includes the three children of Dr. Felix Honecker, one of the so-called fathers of the first atomic bomb. Dr. Honecker himself was no doubt a member of my caress, though he was dead before my sinukas, the tendrils of my life, began to tangle with those of his children. The first of his heirs to be touched by my sinukas was Newton Honecker, the youngest of his three children, the younger of his two sons. I wrote this letter to Newt. Dear Mr. Honecker, I'm gathering material for a book relating to the first atomic bomb. Since your late father is generally recognized as having been one of the chief creators of the bomb, I would very much appreciate any anecdotes you might care to give me of life in your father's house on the day the bomb was dropped. I'm sorry to say that I don't know as much about your illustrious family as I should, and so don't know whether you have brothers or sisters. If you do have brothers and sisters, I would like very much to have their addresses so that I can send similar requests to them. I realize that you were a very young man when the bomb was dropped, which is all to the good. My book is going to emphasize the human rather than the technical side of the bomb. So recollections of the day through the eyes of a baby, if you'll pardon the expression, would fit in perfectly. To which Newt replied, I was only six years old when they dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, so anything I remember about that day, other people have helped me to remember. I remember I was playing in the living room carpet outside my father's study in Ilium, New York. The door was open, and I could see my father. He was wearing pajamas and a bathrobe. He was smoking a cigar. He was playing with a loop of string. Father was staying home from the laboratory in his pajamas all day that day. He stayed home whenever he wanted to. 
father, as you probably know, spent practically his whole professional life working for the research laboratory of the General Forge and Foundry Company in Ilium. When the Manhattan Project came along, the bomb project, father wouldn't leave Ilium to work on it. He said he wouldn't work on it at all unless they let him work where he wanted to work. A lot of the time that meant at home. The only place he liked to go outside of Ilium was our cottage on Cape Cod. Cape Cod was where he died. He died on a Christmas Eve. You probably know that too. Anyway, I was playing on the carpet outside his study on the day of the bomb. My sister Angela tells me I used to play with little toy trucks for hours making motor sounds going Burton, 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 Burton all the time. So I guess I was going Burton, 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 Burton on the day of the bomb, and Father was in his study playing with the loop of string. It so happens I know where the string he was playing with came from. Maybe you can use it somewhere in your book. Father took the string from around the manuscript of a novel that a man in prison had sent him. The novel was about the end of the world in the year 2000, and the name of the book was 2000 A.D., it told about how mad scientists made a terrific bomb that wiped out the whole world. There was a big sex orgy when everybody knew that the world was going to end. And then Jesus Christ himself appeared ten seconds before the bomb went off. My father never read the book, I'm pretty sure. I don't think he ever read a novel or even a short story in his whole life. At least not since he was a little boy. He didn't read his mail or magazines or newspapers either. I suppose he read a lot of technical journals, but to tell you the truth, I can't remember my father reading anything. As I say, all he wanted from that manuscript was a string. That was the way he was. Nobody could predict what he was going to be interested in next. On the day of the bomb, it was string. Have you ever read the speech he made when he accepted the Nobel Prize? This is the whole speech. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you now because I never stopped dawdling like an eight-year-old on a spring morning on his way to school. Anything can make me stop and look in wonder and sometimes learn. I'm a very happy man. Thank you. Anyway, Father looked at that loop of string for a while, and then his fingers started playing with it. His fingers made the string figure called a cat's cradle. I don't know where Father learned how to do that. From his father, maybe. His father was a tailor, you know, so there must have been thread and string around all the time when father was a boy. Making the cat's cradle was the closest I ever saw my father come to playing what anybody else would call a game. He had no use at all for tricks and games and rules that other people had made up. In a scrapbook my sister Angela used to keep up, there was a clipping from Time magazine when somebody asked father what games he played for relaxation, and he said, why should I bother with made-up games when there are so many real ones going on? He must have surprised himself when he made a cat's cradle out of the string, and maybe it reminded him of his own childhood. He all of a sudden came out of his study and did something he'd never done before. He tried to play with me. Not only had he never played with me before, he had hardly even spoken to me. But he went down on his hands and knees on the carpet next to me, and he showed me his teeth, and he waved the tangle of string in my face. See, 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 he asked. Cat's cradle. See the cat's cradle? See where the nice pussy cat sleeps? Meow, meow. Angela was 22 then. She had been the real head of the family since she was 16, since mother died, since I was born. She used to talk about how she had three children, me, Frank, and father. She wasn't exaggerating either. I can remember cold mornings when she, Frank, father, and I would all be in line in the front hall and Angela would be bundling us up, treating us exactly the same, only I was going to kindergarten, Frank was going to junior high school, and Father was going to work on the atomic bomb. Will that do? Is that any help to your book? Of course, you really tied me down asking me to stick to the day of the bomb. There are lots of other good anecdotes about the bomb and Father from other days. For instance, do you know the story about Father on the day they first tested a bomb out at Almogardo? After the thing went off, after it was a sure thing that America could wipe out a city with just one bomb, a scientist turned to Father and said, Science has now known sin. And do you know what Father said? He said, What is sin? All the best, Newton Honecker. P.S. You call our family illustrious, and I think you would maybe be making a mistake if you called it that in your book. I am a midget, for instance, four feet tall, 
And the last we heard of my brother Frank, he was wanted by the Florida police, the FBI, and the Treasury Department for running stolen cars to Cuba on war surplus LSTs. So I'm pretty sure illustrious isn't quite the word you're after. Glamorous is probably closer to the truth. PPS. 24 hours later, I have reread this letter and I can see where somebody might get the impression that I don't do anything but sit around and remember sad things and pity myself. Actually, I'm a very lucky person and I know it. I'm about to marry a wonderful little girl. There is love enough in this world for everybody if people will just look. I am proof of this. Newt did not tell me who his girlfriend was. But about two weeks after he wrote to me, everybody in the country knew that her name was Zinka, plain Zinka. Apparently she didn't have a last name. Zinka was a Ukrainian midget, a dancer with the Borzoi Dance Company. As it happened, Newt saw a performance by that company in Indianapolis. When the performance was over, little Newt was outside the stage door with a dozen long-stemmed American Beauty roses. The newspapers picked up the story when little Zinka asked for political asylum in the United States and then she and little Newt disappeared. One week after that, little Zinka presented herself at the Russian embassy. She said Americans were too materialistic. She said she wanted to go home. I loafed on my book about the day of the bomb. About a year later, two days before Christmas, another story carried me through Ilium, New York, where Dr. Felix Honecker had done most of his work, where little Newt, Frank, and Angela had spent their formative years made an appointment with Dr. Asa Breed, vice president in charge of the research laboratory of the General Forge and Foundry Company. I suppose Dr. Breed was a member of my caress too, though he took a dislike to me almost immediately. Likes and dislikes have nothing to do with it, says Baconan. It's an easy warning to forget. Dr. Breed made an appointment with me for early the next morning. He would pick me up at my hotel. On his way to work, he said, thus simplifying my entry into the heavily guarded research laboratory. Breed was a pink old man, very prosperous, beautifully dressed. His manner was civilized, optimistic, capable, serene. I, by contrast, felt bristly, diseased, cynical. We climbed the four granite steps before the research laboratory. The building itself was of unadorned brick and rose six stories. We passed between two heavily armed guards at the entrance. I smiled at one of the guards. He did not smile back. There was nothing funny about national security, nothing at all. When we got to Dr. Breed's inner office, I started to ask Dr. Breed questions about the day of the bomb. I'm sick of people misunderstanding what a scientist is, what a scientist does, he said. I'll do my best to clear up the misunderstanding, I said. In this country, he said, most people don't even understand what pure research is. I'd appreciate it if you'd tell me what it is. It isn't looking for a better cigarette filter or a softer face tissue or a longer lasting house paint. God help us. Everybody talks about research and practically nobody in the country is doing it. We're one of the few companies that actually hires men to do pure research. When most other companies brag about their research, they're talking about industrial hack technicians who wear white coats, work out of cookbooks, and dream up an improved windshield wiper or next year's Oldsmobile. But here I asked him, here and shockingly few other places in this country, men are paid to increase knowledge, to work to no end but that. I said to him, that's very generous of General Forge and Foundry Company. Nothing generous about it, he said. New knowledge is the most valuable commodity on earth. The more truth we have to work with, the richer we become. Had I been a Baconanist then, that statement would have made me howl. Do you mean, I said to Dr. Breed, that nobody in this laboratory is ever told what to work on? Nobody even suggests what they work on? Oh, people suggest things all the time, but it isn't in the nature of a pure research man to pay any attention to suggestions. His head is full of projects of his own, and that's the way we want it. Did anybody ever try to suggest projects to Dr. Honecker, I said? Certainly, he said, admirals and generals in particular. They looked upon him as a sort of magician who could make America invincible with a wave of his wand. I remember shortly before Felix died, there was a marine general who was hounding him to do something about mud. Mud, I said. The marines, after almost 200 years of wallowing in mud, were sick of it, said Dr. Breed. 
The general, as their spokesman, felt that one of the aspects of progress should be that Marines no longer had to fight in mud. What did the general have in mind? The absence of mud, said Dr. Breed, no more mud. And what did Dr. Honecker say? In his playful way, and all his ways were playful, Felix suggested that there might be a single grain of something, even a microscopic grain, that could make infinite expanses of muck, marsh, swamp, creeks, pools, quicksand, and mire as solid as this desk. Dr. Breed banged his speckled old fist on the desk. The desk was a kidney-shaped, sea-green steel affair. One Marine could carry more than enough of the stuff to free an armor division bogged down in the Everglades. According to Felix, one Marine could carry enough of the stuff to do that under the nail of his little finger. That's impossible, I said. He was able to explain it to me, said Dr. Breed, and I'm sure that I can explain it to you. There are several ways, Dr. Breed said to me, in which certain liquids can crystallize, can freeze. Several ways in which their atoms can stack and lock in an orderly, rigid way. That old man with spotted hands invited me to think of the several ways in which cannonballs might be stacked on a courthouse lawn, or the several ways in which oranges might be packed into a crate. And he helped me to see that the pattern of the bottom layers of the cannonballs, or of oranges, determined how each subsequent layer would stack and lock. The bottom layer is the seed of how every cannonball or every orange it comes after is going to behave even to an infinite number of cannonballs and oranges. Now suppose, chortled Dr. Breed, enjoying himself, that there were many possible ways in which water could crystallize, could freeze. Suppose that the sort of ice we skate upon and put into highballs, what we might call ice one, is only one of several types of ice. Suppose water always froze as ice one on Earth because it had never had a seed to teach it how to form ice two, ice three, ice four. And suppose, and he rapped on his desk with his old hand again, that there were one form which we will call ice nine, a crystal as hard as this desk with a melting point of, oh, let us say 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or better still, a melting point of 130 degrees. That old man asked me to think of United States Marines in a godforsaken swamp. Their trucks and tanks and howitzers are wallowing, he complained, sinking and stinking miasma and ooze. He raised a finger and winked at me. But suppose, young man, that one Marine had with him a tiny capsule containing a seed of ice nine, a new way for the atoms of water to stack and lock, to freeze. If that Marine threw that seed into the nearest puddle, the puddle would freeze, I guess, and all the muck around the puddle, he said, it would freeze. And all the puddles in the frozen muck, he said, they would freeze. And the pools and streams in the frozen muck, he said, they would freeze. You bet they would, he cried. And the United States Marines would rise from the swamp and march on. There is such stuff, I asked. No, 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 said Dr. Breed, losing patience with me again. I only told you all this in order to give you some insight into the extraordinary novelty of the ways in which Felix was likely to approach an old problem. What I've just told you is what he told a Marine general who was hounding him about mud. Felix ate alone here in the cafeteria every day. It was a rule that no one was to sit with him to interrupt his chain of thought. But the Marine general barged in, pulled up a chair, and started talking about mud. What I've told you was Felix's offhand reply. There, there really isn't such a thing, I said. I just told you there wasn't, cried Dr. Breed hotly. Felix died shortly after that, and if you'd been listening to what I've been trying to tell you about pure research men, you wouldn't ask such a question. Pure research men work on what fascinates them, not on what fascinates other people. I keep thinking about that swamp, I said. Well, you can stop thinking about it. I've made the only point I wanted to make with that swamp. If the streams flowing through the swamp froze as ice nine, I said, what about the rivers and the lakes? The streams fed. They'd freeze, but there is no such thing as ice nine. And the oceans, the frozen rivers fed? They'd freeze, of course, he snapped. I suppose you're going to rush to market with a sensational story about ice nine now. I tell you again, it does not exist. And the springs feeding the frozen lakes and streams, I said, and all the water underground feeding the springs? They'd freeze, damn it, he cried. 
But if I'd known you were a member of the Yellow Press, I wouldn't have wasted a minute with you. In the rain, I said, when it fell, it would freeze into hard little hobnails of Ice Nine. And that would be the end of the world and the end of the interview, too. Goodbye. Dr. Breed was mistaken about at least one thing. There was such a thing as Ice Nine. And Ice Nine was on Earth. Ice Nine was the last gift Felix Honecker created for mankind before going to his just reward. He did it without anyone's realizing what he was doing. He did it without leaving records of what he had done. He had made a chip of Ice Nine. It was blue-white. It had a melting point of 114.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Felix Honecker had put the chip in a little bottle, and he put the bottle in his pocket. And he had gone to his cottage on Cape Cod with his three children, there intending to celebrate Christmas. Angela had been 34. Frank had been 24. Little Newt had been 18. The old man had died on Christmas Eve, having told only his children about Ice Nine. His children had divided the Ice Nine among themselves. <laughs> And then one day, one Sunday, I found out where the fugitive from justice was, where Franklin Honecker could be found. He was alive. The news was in a special supplement to the New York Sunday Times. The supplement was a paid ad for a banana republic. On its cover was a profile of the most heartbreakingly beautiful girl I ever hoped to see. Beyond the girl, bulldozers were knocking down palm trees, making a broad avenue. At the end of the avenue were the steel skeletons of three new buildings. The Republic of San Lorenzo, said the copy on the cover, on the move, a healthy, happy, progressive, freedom-loving, beautiful nation makes itself extremely attractive to American investors and tourists alike. I was in no hurry to read the contents. The girl on the cover was enough for me, more than enough, since I had fallen in love with her on sight. She was very young and very grave, too, and luminously compassionate and wise. She was as brown as chocolate. Her hair was like golden flax. Her name was Mona Amans Manzano, the cover said. She was the adopted daughter of the dictator of the island. I opened the supplement, hoping for more pictures of this sublime mongrel Madonna. I found instead a portrait of the island's dictator, Miguel Papa Manzano, a gorilla in his late 70s. Next to Papa's portrait was a picture of a narrow-shouldered, fox-faced, immature young man. He wore a snow-white military blouse with some sort of jeweled sunburst hanging on it. His eyes were close together. They had circles under them. This unattractive child was identified as Major General Franklin Honecker, Minister of Science and Progress in the Republic of San Lorenzo. He was 26 years old. I wondered how Franklin Honecker, who had never even finished high school, had got himself such a fancy job. I found a partial answer in a florid essay titled What San Lorenzo Has Meant to One American. It was almost certainly ghost-written. It was signed by Major General Franklin Honecker. In the essay, Frank told of being all alone on a nearly swamped 68-foot crisscraft on the Caribbean. He didn't explain what he was doing on it or how he happened to be alone. He did indicate, though, that his point of departure had been Cuba. The luxurious pleasure craft was going down and my meaningless life with it, said the essay. All I'd eaten for four days was two biscuits and a seagull. The dorsal fins of man-eating sharks were cleaving the warm seas all around me, and needle-teeth barracuda were making those waters boil. I raised my eyes to my maker, willing to accept whatever his decision might be, and my eyes alit on a glorious mountain peak above the clouds. What Frank saw from his sinking pleasure craft was the peak of Mount McCabe. Gentle seas then nuzzled Frank's pleasure craft to the rocky shores of San Lorenzo, as though God wanted him to go there. Frank stepped ashore, dry shod, and asked where he was. The essay didn't say so, but the son of a bitch had a piece of ice nine with him in a thermos jug. Frank, having no passport, was put in jail in the capital city of Bolivar. He was visited there by Papa Manzano who wanted to know if it was possible that Frank was a blood relative of the immortal Dr. Felix Honecker. I admitted I was, said Frank in the essay, 
since that moment, every door to opportunity in San Lorenzo has been opened to me. As it happened, as it was supposed to happen, Baconan would say, I was assigned by a magazine to do a story in San Lorenzo. The story wasn't to be about Papa Manzano or Frank. It was to be about Julian Castle, an American sugar millionaire who had, at the age of 40, followed the example of Dr. Albert Schweitzer by founding a free hospital in a jungle by devoting his life to miserable folk of another race. Castle's hospital was called the House of Hope and Mercy in the Jungle. I flew to San Lorenzo. The seating on the airplane bound ultimately for San Lorenzo from Miami was three and three. There was a small saloon in the rear of the plane and I repaired there for a drink. It was there I met another fellow American, H. Lowe Crosby of Evanston, Illinois, and his wife, Hazel. They were heavy people in their 50s. They spoke twangingly. Crosby told me that he owned a bicycle factory in Chicago, that he had had nothing but ingratitude from his employees. He was going to move his business to grateful San Lorenzo. You know San Lorenzo well, I asked. This will be the first time I've ever seen it, but everything I've heard about it I like, said H. Lowe Crosby. They've got discipline. They've got something you can count on from one year to the next. They don't have the government encouraging everybody to be some kind of original pissant nobody ever heard of before. Sir? Christ, back in Chicago, we don't make bicycles anymore, he said. It's all human relations now. The eggheads sit around trying to figure out new ways for everybody to be happy. Nobody can get fired, no matter what. And if somebody does accidentally make a bicycle, the union accuses us of cruel and inhuman practices, and the government confiscates the bicycle for back taxes and gives it to a blind man in Afghanistan. And you think things will be better in San Lorenzo, I asked him. I know damn well they will be. The people down there are poor enough and scared enough and ignorant enough to have some common sense. Crosby asked me what my name was and what my business was. I told him, and his wife Hazel recognized my name as an Indiana name. She was from Indiana, too. My God, she said, are you a Hoosier? I admitted I was. I'm a Hoosier, too, she crowed. Nobody has to be ashamed of being a Hoosier. I'm not, I said. I never knew anybody who was. Hoosiers do all right, she said. Lo and I have been around the world twice, and everywhere we went, we found Hoosiers in charge of everything. That's reassuring. You know the manager of the new hotel in Istanbul, she said? No. He's a Hoosier, and the military, whatever it is, in Tokyo. Attaché, said her husband. He's a Hoosier, said Hazel. She grasped me firmly by the arm. We Hoosiers got to stick together. Right, I said. You call me Mom. What? Whenever I meet a young Hoosier, I tell them, you call me Mom. Uh-huh, I said. Let me hear you say it, she urged. Mom. Hazel's obsession with Hoosiers around the world was a textbook example of a false caress, of a seeming team that was meaningless in terms of the way God gets things done. A textbook example of what Baconan calls a grand falloon. Other examples of grand falloon are the Communist Party, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the General Electric Company, the International Order of Odd Fellows, and any nation, any time, anywhere. H. Lowe Crosby was of the opinion that dictatorships were often very good things. He wasn't a terrible person, and he wasn't a fool. It suited him to confront the world with a certain barnyard clownishness. But many of the things he had to say about undisciplined mankind were not only funny, but true. They just don't have any crime down there, he told me. Papa Manzano's made crime so damn unattractive nobody even thinks about it without getting sick. I heard you can lay a billfold in the middle of a sidewalk and you can come back a week later and it'll be right there with everything still in it. Aha, uh -huh, I said. You know what the punishment is for stealing something? No. The hook, he said. No fines, no probation, no 30 days in jail. It's a hook. The hook for stealing, for murder, for arson, for treason, for rape, for being a peeping Tom. Break a law, any damn law at all, and it's the hook. Everybody can understand that, and San Lorenzo is the best-behaved country in the world. What is the hook, I asked him. They put up a gallows, see, two posts and a crossbeam, and then they take a great big kind of iron fish hook and they hang it down from the crossbeam. Then they take somebody who's dumb enough to break the law, and they put the point of the hook in through one side of his belly and out the other, and then they let him go, and there he hangs, by God, one damn sorry lawbreaker. 
Good God, I said. I don't say it's good, said Crosby, but I don't say it's bad either. I sometimes wonder if something like that wouldn't clear up juvenile delinquency. Maybe the hook's a little extreme for a democracy. Public hangings more like it. String up a few teenage car thieves on lampposts in front of their houses with signs around their necks saying, Mama, here's your boy. Do that a few times, and I think ignition locks would go the way of the rumble seat and running boards. We saw that thing in the basement of the waxworks in London, said Hazel. What thing, I asked her. The hook, down in the chamber of horrors in the basement. They had a wax person hanging up from a hook in Madame Tussauds. It looked so real I wanted to throw up. As it happened, as it was supposed to happen, my seatmates were Horlick Minton, the new American ambassador to the Republic of San Lorenzo, and his wife, Claire. They were reading a fat typewritten manuscript that was spread across the chair arm between them. When I again took my seat, Minton handed me the manuscript he and his wife had been reading. The name of the book was San Lorenzo, the land, the history, the people. The author was Philip Castle, the son of Julian Castle, the son of the great altruist I was on my way to see. I let the book fall open where it would. As it happened, it fell open to the chapter about the island's outlawed holy man, Baconan. There was a quotation from the books of Baconan on the page before me. Those words leaped out from the page and into my mind, and they were welcomed there. The words were a paraphrase of the suggestion by Jesus, Render, therefore, unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Baconan's paraphrase was this. Pay no attention to Caesar. Caesar doesn't have the slightest idea what's really going on. Conan, I learned from Castle's book, was born in 1891. He was a Negro, born an Episcopalian, and a British subject on the island of Tobago. He was christened Lionel Boyd Johnson. Lionel Boyd Johnson was intellectually ambitious enough in 1911 to sail alone from Tobago to London in a sloop named the Lady Slipper. His purpose was to gain a higher education. He enrolled in the London School of Economics and Political Science. His education was interrupted by the First World War. He enlisted in the infantry, fought with distinction, was commissioned in the field, was mentioned four times in dispatches. He was gassed in the Second Battle of Wipers, was hospitalized for two years, and then discharged. Then he set sail for home, for Tobago, alone in the Lady Slipper again. In 1922, he sought shelter from a hurricane in Port-au-Prince, Haiti which country was then occupied by United States Marines. Johnson was approached there by a brilliant, self-educated, idealistic Marine deserter named Earl McCabe. McCabe was a corporal. He had just stolen his company's recreation fund. He offered Johnson $500 for transportation to Miami. The two set sail for Miami, but a gale hounded the schooner onto the rocks of San Lorenzo. The boat went down, Johnson and McCabe, absolutely naked, managed to swim ashore. How he came by the name of Baconan was very simple. Baconan was the pronunciation given the name Johnson in the island's English dialect. My reading of the life of Baconan was interrupted by H. Lo Crosby's wife, Hazel. She was standing in the aisle next to me. You'll never believe it, she said, but I just found two more Hoosiers on this airplane. I'll be damned, I said. Her name is Connors, and his name is Honecker. So I went aft to talk to Angela Honecker Connors and little Newton Honecker, members of my carass. Angela was a horse-faced platinum blonde I had noticed earlier. Newt was a very tiny young man indeed, though not grotesque. He was as nicely scaled as Gulliver among the Brobdignagians, and as shrewdly watchful, too. I asked if they were bound for a family reunion with Frank and San Lorenzo, said Angela. We're going to the engagement party. Oh, I said, who's the lucky girl? I'll show you, said Angela. And then she showed me a picture of the girl Frank was going to marry. 
she might with equal effect have struck me in the groin. The picture she showed me was of Mona Amans Manzano, the woman I loved. When Lionel Boyd Johnson and Corporal Earl McCabe were washed up naked onto the shore of San Lorenzo, I read, they were greeted by persons far worse off than they. The people of San Lorenzo had nothing but diseases, which they were at a loss to treat or even name. By contrast, Johnson and McCabe had the glittering treasures of literacy, ambition, curiosity, gall, irreverence, health, humor, and considerable information about the outside world. From the Calypsos again. Oh, a very sorry people, yes, did I find here. Oh, they had no music and they had no beer. And oh, everywhere where they tried to perch belonged to Castle Sugar Incorporated or the Catholic Church. There was at least one quality of the new conquerors of San Lorenzo that was really new, wrote Young Castle. McCabe and Johnson dreamed of making San Lorenzo a utopia. To this end, McCabe overhauled the economy and the laws. Johnson designed a new religion. I wanted all things to seem to make some sense So we could all be happy, yes, instead of tense And I made up lies so that they all fit nice And I made this sad world a paradise The custom shed at Manzano Airport was neat and new, but plenty of signs had already been slapped on the walls, higgledy-piggledy. Anybody caught practicing Baconanism in San Lorenzo, said one, will die on the hook. There were seven of us who got off at San Lorenzo, Newt and Angela, Ambassador Minton and his wife, H. Lo Crosby and his wife, and I. When we'd cleared customs, we were herded outdoors and onto a reviewing stand. There we faced a very quiet crowd. Five thousand or more San Lorenzans stared at us. At a limp, imperious signal from Papa, the crowd sang the San Lorenzan National Anthem. The words had been written in 1922 by Lionel Boyd Johnson, by Baconan. Oh, ours is a land where the living is grand. And the men are as fearless as sharks. The women are pure, and we always are sure that our children will all tow their marks. San, San Lorenzo, what a rich, lucky island are we. Our enemies quail, for they know they will fail against people so reverent and free. Papa Manzano wore a shoulder holster on the outside of his blouse. The weapon in it was a chromium-plated 45. He was an old, old man, as so many members of my carass were. He was in poor shape. His steps were small and bounceless. He was still a fat man, but his lard was melting fast, for his simple uniform was loose. The balls of his hop-toed eyes were yellow. His hands trembled. His personal bodyguard was Major General Franklin Honecker, whose uniform was white. Frank, thin-wristed, narrow-shouldered, looked like a child kept up long after his customary bedtime. On his breast was a medal. Papa was a self-educated man who had been Major Domo to Corporal McCabe. He had never been off the island. He spoke American English passably well. Welcome, said Papa. You have picked a very good time to come to us. Tomorrow will be one of the happiest days in the history of our country. Tomorrow is our great national holiday, the day of the hundred martyrs to democracy. It will also be the day of the engagement of Major General Honecker to Mona Amans Manzano, to the most precious person in my life and in the life of San Lorenzo. And then he collapsed. You, he said to Frank hoarsely, you, Franklin Honecker, you will be the next president of San Lorenzo. Science, you have science. Science is the strongest thing there is. Science, said Papa. Ice. He rolled his yellow eyes and he passed out. Papa didn't die. Not then. 
He was rolled away in the airport's big red meat wagon. The Mintons were taken to their embassy by an American limousine. Newt and Angela were taken to Frank's house in a San Lorenzan limousine. Later, I went to Frank's house in San Lorenzo's one taxi cab. A servant who introduced himself as Stanley greeted me politely and told me that Frank wasn't home yet. I asked Stanley if anybody else was home, and he told me that only Newt was. Newt, he said, was out on the cantilevered terrace painting a picture. The painting on which Newt had been working was set on an easel next to the aluminum railing. The painting was framed in a misty view of sky, sea, and valley. Newt's painting was small and black and warty. It consisted of scratches made in a black gummy impasto. The scratches formed a sort of spider's web, and I wondered if they might not be the sticky nets of human futility hung up on a moonless night to dry. Hello, he said to me sleepily. Hello, I said. I like your painting. You see what it is, he asked. I suppose it means something different to everyone who sees it, I said. It's a cat's cradle, he said. Aha, I said, very good. The scratches are string, right? One of the oldest games there is, cat's cradle, said Newt. Even the Eskimos know it. You don't say. For maybe a hundred thousand years or more, said Newt, grown-ups have been waving tangles of string in their children's faces. Aha, uh -huh, I said. Newt remained curled in the chair. He held out his painty hands as though a cat's cradle were strung between them. No wonder kids grow up crazy, he said. A cat's cradle is nothing but a bunch of X's between somebody's hands. And little kids look and look and look at all those X's. And, I said, no damn cat, said Newt, and no damn cradle. And then Angela Honecker Connors, Newt's beanpole sister, came in with Julian Castle, father of Philip, and founder of the House of Hope and Mercy in the jungle. Tell me, doctor, I said to Julian Castle, how is Papa Manzano? How would I know, he said. I thought you'd probably been treating him, I said. We don't speak, said Castle. He smiled. He doesn't speak to me, that is. The last thing he said to me, which was about three years ago, was that the only thing that kept me off the hook was my American citizenship. What have you done to offend him so, I said. You come down here and with your own money found a free hospital for his people? Papa doesn't like the way we treat the whole patient, said Castle, particularly the whole patient when he's dying. At the House of Hope and Mercy in the jungle, we administer the last rites of the Baconinus Church to those who want them. I gather, I said, that there are still several Baconinus on the island, despite the laws, despite the hook. He laughed. You haven't caught on yet. To what, I said. Everybody in San Lorenzo is a devout Baconinus the hook notwithstanding. When Baconan and McCabe took over this miserable country years ago, said Julian Castle, they threw out the priests, and then Baconan, cynically and playfully, invented a new religion. I know, I said. Well, when it became evident that no governmental or economic reform was going to make the people much less miserable, the religion became the one real instrument of hope. Truth was the enemy of the people because the truth was so terrible. So Baconan made it his business to provide the people with better and better lies. How did he come to be an outlaw, I asked. It was his own idea. He asked McCabe to outlaw him and his religion too, in order to give the religious life of the people more zest, more tang. He wrote a little poem about it, incidentally. Castle quoted this poem, which does not appear in the books of Baconan. So I said goodbye to government, and I gave my reason that a really good religion is a form of treason. Baconan suggested the hook, too, as a proper punishment for Baconanus, the doctor said. It was something he'd seen in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussaud's. He winked ghoulishly. That was for zest, too. McCabe and Baconan did not succeed in raising what is generally thought of as the standard of living, said Castle. The truth was that life was as short and brutish and mean as ever, but people didn't have to pay as much attention to the awful truth as the living legend of the cruel tyrant in the city and the gentle holy man in the jungle grew, so too did the happiness of the people grow. Do people still die on the hook, I asked? It's inevitably fatal. I mean, I said, does Papa really have people executed that way? He executes one every two years just to keep the pot boiling, so to speak, said the doctor. 
He sighed, looking up at the evening sky. Busy, busy, busy. Sir, I said. It's what we Baconinists say, he said, when we feel that a lot of mysterious things are going on. You? I was amazed. A Baconinist, too? He gazed at me levelly. You, too. You'll find out. If you aren't Papa's doctor, I said, who is? One of my staff, a Dr. Schlichter von Königswald. A German, I said? Vaguely. He was in the SS for 14 years. He was a camp physician at Auschwitz for six of those years. He's doing penance at the House of Hope and Mercy, is he now? Yes, said Castle, and making great strides, too, saving lives right and left. Good for him, I said. Yes, if he keeps going at his present rate, working night and day, the number of people he has saved will equal the number of people he let die in the year 3010. So there's another member of my caress. Dr. Schlichter von Königswald. About this Franklin Honecker, the pinch-faced child spoke with the timber and conviction of a kazoo. I had heard it said in the army that such and such a man spoke like a man with a paper rectum. Such a man was General Honecker. Now, hoping to be hearty and persuasive, he said tinny things to me, things like, I like the cut of your jib, and I want to talk cold turkey to you, man to man. And he took me down to what he called his den in order that we might call a spade a spade and let the chips fall where they may. Maybe you'd better come to the point, I said. There's no sense in beating around the bush, he said. I'm a pretty good judge of character, if I do say so myself, and I like the cut of your jib. Thank you, I said. I think you and I could really hit it off. I have no doubt of it, I said. We've both got things that mesh, he said. You're a worldly person, used to meeting the public, and I'm a technical person, used to working behind the scenes, making things go. How can you possibly know what kind of a person I am? We've just met, I said. Your clothes, he said, the way you talk. He put his hand on my shoulders again. I like the cut of your jib. So you said. Frank was frantic for me to complete his thought, to do it enthusiastically, but I was still at sea. Am I to understand, I said, that you are offering me some kind of job here in San Lorenzo? He clapped his hands. He was delighted. That's right. What would you say to $100,000 a year? Good God, I cried. What would I have to do for that? Practically nothing, he said. And you'd drink out of gold goblets every night and eat off gold plates and have a palace all your own? What's the job, I said. The President of the Republic of San Lorenzo. Me? President, I gasped. Who else is there, he said. This is nuts, I said. Don't say no until you've really thought about it. Frank watched me anxiously. No, I said. You haven't really thought about it. I've thought about it enough to know it's crazy, I said. We'd work together, said Frank. I'd be backing you all the time. Good, I said. So if I got plugged from the front, you'd get it too. Plugged, he said. Shot, assassinated. Frank was mystified. Why would anybody shoot you? So he could get to be president, I said. Frank shook his head. Nobody in San Lorenzo wants to be president. It's against their religion. It's against your religion, too, I said. I thought you were going to be the next president. I... He found it hard to go on. He looked haunted. You what, I said. Maturity, the way I understand it, he told me is knowing what your limitations are. He wasn't far from Baconin in defining maturity. Maturity, Baconin tells us, is a bitter disappointment for which no remedy exists, unless laughter can be said to remedy anything. Frank said to me, come on, be president of San Lorenzo. You'd be real good at it with your personality, please. There must be a catch, I hedged. There isn't, said Frank. There'll be an election, I said. There never has been. We'll just announce who the new president is. And nobody will object? Nobody objects to anything, said Frank. They aren't interested. They don't care. There has to be a catch, I said. There's kind of one, Frank admitted. I knew it. I began to shrink from my vendette. What is it? What's the catch? Well, it isn't really a catch, because you don't have to do it if you don't want to. It would be a good idea, though, said Frank. Let's hear this great idea. Well, if you're going to be president, 
I think you really ought to marry Mona. But you don't have to if you don't want to. You're the boss. She would have me, I said. If she'd have me, she'd have you, said Frank. All you have to do is ask her. Why should she say yes? It's predicted in the books of Baconan that she'll marry the next president of San Lorenzo, said Frank. So I became betrothed at dawn to the most beautiful woman in the world, and I agreed to become the next president of San Lorenzo. Papa wasn't dead yet, and it was Frank's feeling that I should get Papa's blessing if possible. So, as Borisisi the sun came up, Frank and I drove to Papa's castle in a jeep we commandeered from troops guarding the next president. Papa Manzano and his merciless disease were in a bed that was made of a golden dinghy, tiller, painter, oarlocks and all, all gilded. The bed was a lifeboat of Baconan's old schooner, the Lady's Slipper. It was a lifeboat of the ship that had brought Baconan and Corporal McCabe to San Lorenzo so long ago. The walls of the room were white, but Papa radiated paint so hot and bright that the walls seemed bathed in an angry red. He was stripped from the waist up, and his glistening belly wall was knotted. His belly shivered like a luffing sail. Around his neck hung a chain with a cylinder the size of a rifle cartridge for a pendant. I supposed that the cylinder contained some magic charm. I was mistaken. It contained a splinter of ice nine. Papa could hardly speak. His teeth chattered and his breathing was beyond control. Papa whispered Frank. Goodbye, Papa gasped. His eyes were bugging sightless. I brought a friend, said Frank. Goodbye, said Papa. He's going to be the next president of San Lorenzo. He'll be a much better president than I could be, said Frank. Ice, Papa whimpered. He asks for ice, said von Königswald. When we bring it, he does not want it. Does not matter, said Papa, who is president of... He didn't finish. I finished the sentence for him. San Lorenzo, I said. San Lorenzo, Papa agreed. He managed a crooked smile. Good luck, he croaked. Thank you, sir, I said. He fell silent, relaxed, closed his eyes, and then he whispered, Last rites. But Papa didn't die and go to heaven, not then. I asked Frank how we might best time the announcement of my elevation to the presidency. Frank was no help, had no ideas. He left it all up to me. I thought you were going to back me up, I complained. As far as anything technical goes, said Frank. Frank was prim about it. I wasn't to violate his integrity as a technician. It wasn't to make him exceed the limits of his job. I see, I said. However you want to handle the people is all right with me, said Frank. That's your responsibility. This abrupt abdication of Frank from all human affairs shocked and angered me. And I said to him, meaning to be satirical, you mind telling me what, in a purely technical way, is planned for this day of days? I got a strictly technical reply. Repair the power plant and stage an air show, said Frank. Air show, I asked. What's that? I got another wooden reply. At one o'clock this afternoon, sir... Six planes of the San Lorenzo Air Force will fly past the palace here and shoot at targets in the water. It's part of the celebration of the day of the hundred martyrs to democracy. The American ambassador also plans to throw a wreath into the sea. So I decided tentatively that I would have Frank announce my apotheosis immediately following the wreath ceremony in the air show. What do you think of that, I said to Frank. You're the boss, sir, he said. I think I'd better have a speech ready, I said. So I wrote my speech in a round, bare room at the foot of a tower. There was a table and a chair, and the speech I wrote was round and bare and sparsely furnished, too. It was hopeful. It was humble. And I found it impossible not to lean on God. I had never needed such support before, and so had never believed that such support was available. Now I found that I had to believe in it, and I did. I pondered asking Baconan to join my government, thus bringing about a sort of millennium for my people. And I thought of ordering that awful hook outside the palace gate to be taken down at once amidst great rejoicing. But then I understood that a millennium would have to offer something more than a holy man in a position of power. That there would have to be plenty of good things for all to eat, too, and nice places to live for all, and good schools and good health and good times for all, and work for all who wanted it, things Baconan and I were in no position to provide. I was met by Dr. Schlichter von Königswald, who was bounding from Papa's bedroom. He had a wild look. He took me by the arms and he cried, What is it? What was it he had hanging around his neck? I beg your pardon, I said. 
He took it. Whatever was in that cylinder, Papa took, and now he's dead. I remembered the cylinder Papa had hung around his neck, and I made an obvious guess as to its contents. Cyanide? Cyanide. Cyanide turns a man to cement in a second. Cement? Marble. Iron. I have never seen such a wretched corpse before. Strike it anywhere, and you got a note like a marimba. Come look. Von Königswald hustled me into Papa's bedroom. Papa's head was bent back as far as it would go. His weight rested on the crown of his head and the soles of his feet, with the rest of his body forming a bridge whose arch thrust toward the ceiling. He was shaped like an andiron, and Papa's lips and nostrils and eyeballs were glazed with a blue-white frost. Such a syndrome is no novelty now, God knows, but it certainly was then. Papa Manzano was the first man in history to die of Ice Nine. I record the fact for whatever it may be worth. Write it all down, Bakonin tells us. He is really telling us, of course, how futile it is to write or read histories. Without accurate records of the past, how can men and women be expected to avoid making serious mistakes in the future, he asks ironically. So again, Papa Manzano was the first man in history to die of Ice Nine. Dr. von Koenigswald, the humanitarian with the terrible deficit of Auschwitz and his kindliness account, was the second to die of Ice Nine. Von Königswald went to a basin of water, meaning to wash his hands. When I turned to look at him, he told me, his hands poised over the water, he was dead, as hard as a statue, just as you see him. I brushed my fingers over his lips. They looked so peculiar. He put his hands into the water. What chemical could possibly... The question trailed off. Von Königswald raised his hands, and the water in the basin came with them. It was no longer water, but a hemisphere of ice nine. Von Königswald touched the tip of his tongue to the blue-white mystery. Frost bloomed on his lips. He froze solid, tottered, and crashed. The blue-white hemisphere shattered. Chunks skittered all over the floor. I went to the door and bawled for help. Soldiers and servants came running. I ordered them to bring Frank and Newton and Angela to Papa's room at once. I let the three children of Dr. Felix Honecker into Papa Manzano's bedroom. I closed the door and I put my back to it. My mood was bitter and grand. I knew Ice Nine for what it was. I had seen it often in my dreams. I could see Frank dissociating himself from the causes of the mess, identifying himself with growing pride and energy, with the purifiers, the world savers, the cleaners up. Brooms, dustpans, blowtorch, hot plate, buckets, he commanded, snapping, snapping, snapping his fingers. You propose applying a blowtorch to the bodies, I asked him. Frank was so charged with technical thinking now that he was practically tap dancing to the music of his fingers. We'll sweep up the big pieces on the floor, melt them in a bucket on a hot plate, he said. Then we'll go over every square inch of the floor with a blowtorch in case there are any microscopic crystals. What we'll do with the bodies and the bed? He had to think some more. A funeral pyre, he cried, really pleased with himself. I'll have a great big funeral pyre built out by the hook, and we'll have the bodies and the bed carried out and thrown in. How could you give Ice Nine to a man like Papa Manzano, Angela asked him. Let's clean up the mess first, said Frank, and then we can talk. I gathered that the Republic of San Lorenzo and the three Honeckers weren't the only ones who had Ice Nine. Apparently the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics had it too. The United States had obtained it through Angela's husband, whose plant in Indianapolis was understandably surrounded by electrified fences and homicidal German shepherds. And Soviet Russia had come by Ice Nine through Newt's little Zinka, that winsome troll of Ukrainian ballet. I was without comment. But the bodies still had to be carried to the funeral pyre. We decided that this should be done with pomp that we should put it off until the ceremonies in honor of the hundred martyrs to democracy were over. So I mounted the spiral staircase of my tower, arrived at the uppermost battlement of my castle, and looked out at my guests, my servants, my cliff, and my lukewarm sea. The Honeckers were with me. We had locked Papa's door and had spread the word among the household staff that Papa was feeling much better. Soldiers were now building a funeral pyre out by the hook. They did not know what the pyre was for. There were many, many secrets that day. Busy, busy, busy. I supposed that the ceremonies might as well begin. 
There was a hum in the air. The six planes of the San Lorenzan Air Force were coming, skimming my lukewarm sea. They were going to shoot the effigies of what H. Low Crosby had called practically every enemy that freedom ever had. We went to the seaward parapet to see the show. The planes were no larger than grains of black pepper. We were able to spot them because one, as it happened, was trailing smoke. We supposed that the smoke was part of the show. I saw that the planes would be coming in low below the footings of the castle and that I would miss the show. I turned my head in the direction of their now snarling approach. Just as their guns began to hammer, one plane, the one that had been trailing smoke, suddenly appeared belly up and in flames. It dropped from my line of sight again and crashed at once into the cliff below the castle. Its bombs and fuel exploded. The surviving planes went booming on, their racket thinning down to a mosquito hum. And then there was the sound of a rock slide, and one great tower of Papa's castle, undermined, crashed down to the sea. The people on the seaward parapet looked in astonishment at the empty socket where the tower had stood. Then I could hear rock slides of all sizes in conversation that was almost orchestral. The conversation went very fast, and new voices entered in. They were the voices of the castle's timbers, lamenting that their burdens were becoming too great. The palace, its massive seaward mask now gone, greeted the north with a leper's smile, snaggletooth and bristly. The bristles were the splintered ends of timbers. Immediately below me, a large chamber had been laid open. The floor of the chamber, unsupported, stabbed out into space like a diving platform. I dreamed for a moment of dropping to the platform, of springing up from it in a breathtaking swan dive, of folding my arms, of knifing downward into a blood-warm eternity with never a splash. I was recalled from my dream by the cry of a darting bird above me. It seemed to be asking me what had happened. Hooty wheat, it asked. We all looked up at the bird and then at one another. We backed away from the abyss, full of dread. And when I stepped off the paving stone that was supporting me, the stone began to rock. It was no more stable than a teeter-totter, and it tottered now over the diving platform. Down it crashed onto the platform, made the platform a chute, and down the chute came the furnishing still remaining in the room below. A xylophone shot out first, scampering fast on its tiny wheel. Out came a bedside table in a crazy race with a bounding blowtorch. Out came chairs in hot pursuit. And somewhere in that room below, out of sight, something mightily reluctant to move was beginning to move. Down the chute it crept. At last it showed its golden bow. It was the boat in which dead Papa Manzano lay. It reached the end of the chute. Its bow nodded. Down it tipped. Down it fell, end over end. Papa was thrown clear and he fell separately. I closed my eyes. There was a sound like that of the gentle closing of a portal as big as the sky, the great door of heaven being closed softly. It was a grand ah -hoom. I opened my eyes and all the sea was ice nine. We do, doodly do, doodly do, doodly do what we must, muddly must, muddly must, muddly must, muddly do, muddly do, muddly do, muddly do, until we bust, bodily bust, bodily bust, bodily bust. There were no smells, there was no movement. Every step I took made a gravelly squeak in blue white frost, and every squeak was echoed loudly. The season of locking was over. The earth was locked up tight. It was winter, now and forever. And I remembered the 14th book of Baconan, which I had read in its entirety the night before. The 14th book is entitled, What Can a Thoughtful Man Hope for Mankind on Earth, Given the Experience of the Past Million Years? It doesn't take long to read the 14th book. It consists of one word and a period. This is the word, nothing.